Hi, this is the long-awaited, at least by me, a video about the formation of West Virginia, how West Virginia became a state. I had a little angst about this video because after I told Octavi I would do it, I, I began to realize just what I was taking on. So the people who watch my videos don't expect this kind of thing. Now, this isn't, you know, I do a lot of silly, goofy stuff and a few serious videos. It's been a mixed bag, but still they aren't quite expecting this. It leaves me with the uh, task of uh, trying to present this information in a logical way so that everybody will understand the players and basically what's going on. Uh, what, how I'm going to do this then is uh, a two video process. This video is the preface and so I will explain a few things um, about the next video. The next video will be a reading uh, from Virginia the Old Dominion by Matthew Page Andrews. I'll just explain a few things about the reading that I'll do. Then, so when I begin the next video, and I, I'll launch right into the reading, that will make more sense to everyone. The content of this also has to do with the subject of slavery. It's incorporated into the story of uh, West Virginia becoming a state. You, you will hear terms that, are, that were in popular use during the Civil War era and even into 1932 at the time of this writing. So it's um, I, not always easy to tell whether Matthew Page Andrews was speaking within the context of that era or within the context of his own time. So uh, at any rate, you will hear language such as the Negro, you know, when referring to the slaves, the Negro. And you will hear a man uh, named John S. Carlyle describe his perception of slavery in a very appalling term, um, <clears throat> but this is a part of history. You will also hear a reference to Lincoln that may fly in the face of things you've been taught about Lincoln in the past. It may be of no surprise to you at all, and I would pay close attention to the very reason that um, um, Waitman T. Willie and uh, John S. Carlyle were so highly motivated to see West Virginia become a state. Um, uh, so I will start out by saying that the western region of Virginia was pro-Union and there was a bit of resentment uh, <coughs> preceding that between the western region of Virginia, the western county, and the eastern region of Virginia because although taxes were equally um, divided amongst all the regions, not all of the regions reached the benefits. The public works were primarily in the more affluent eastern regions, so we can understand the resentment of the western counties. Uh, at any rate, that's the background. Uh, you will hear a reference to the McClellan campaign. That would be uh, George B. McClellan, who was Major General of the Department of the Ohio, the Army of the Ohio, and uh, he came down to West Virginia to secure that for the Union. It was pro-Union region of Virginia and so Lincoln would be highly motivated to have it be part of the Union. <laughs> um, okay, uh, George McClellan came to the Civil War with a very impressive background. He graduated second in his class at West Point. He was um, promoted in the field or breveted three times during the Mexican War, so things looked very good uh, to have McClellan in this position as a general, major general. He would subsequently rise to the rank of general, general in chief of the army. A reference to Kanawha, and you will see that, you, just one uh, reference as I recall. Uh, Kanawha is a river that runs, you may have, you know, recall that uh, there was a map in the beginning of this video showing the Kanawha River and also showing the watersheds to the Kanawha River. Watershed basically is the land area that drains into a particular river or stream. Okay, uh, the last name I can think to mention is General B.S. Butler, who I'm sure is a Benjamin Franklin Butler of Massachusetts. He is better known in the South as Beast Butler, and he earned that name in, while in New Orleans. Following the capture of New Orleans for the Union by the United States Navy, um, General Butler of the United States Army was charged with maintaining order in New Orleans. He established martial law. He was a very... Uh, well, he could be a bit cruel, I suppose. <laughs> a group of men from New Orleans had torn down the United States flag that had been raised over the mint. And so uh, 
General Butler found uh, one man bragging about taking part in this, and he found a piece of the flag in the man's buttonhole, so he hanged the man in front of the men, and uh, that did subdue the men. However, the women, <laughs> the women of New Orleans were undaunted. Uh, they would jeer and and to hold their noses as Yankees walked by. They wore Confederate insignia on their clothing. And one woman went so far as to empty her chamber pot over the head of one David G. Farragut, <laughs> Rear Admiral, United States Navy. <laughs> well, Admiral Farragut happened to command the assault force, the naval assault force, that caused the fall of New Orleans. <laughs> At any rate, um, General Butler decided that enough was enough, so he issued the infamous General Order 28, or the Woman Order, and uh, basically it stated that any woman of any woman uh, caught treating an officer of the United States Army disrespectfully would be tried as a woman of the town flying her avocation. <laughs> she would be tried as a prostitute. <laughs> there goes my son. You're going to have to wait. <laughs> he was also known in the South as Spoon Butler for his alleged uh, proclivity for pilfering the silver of southern homes he visited. <laughs> oh, God. So uh, I think that's about all I can think to tell you that will help you understand some of the names you'll hear in this reading. So, Octavie, I do apologize for this very long delay. Um, for those of you who don't know Octavie, uh, we, he, we are mutually subscribed. He's interested in the United States Civil War also. And so... In a manner of speaking, I've copied him, his style. He does, he reads, and then he actually follows up with a video. Uh, his, you know, he'll have further comments about the reading. So I'm just doing that in reverse order, and I stated my reasons, so my subscribers are kind of all caught up to date. The United States Civil War took place in the first half of the 1860s, and so the time setting at the beginning of this reading is 1861. Okay, any questions? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, we'll see you in the next video.